the idea of actually ending homelessness among any population is, seems so far-fetched, and yet it's actually happening. Um, it has happened in New Orleans, and you'll be hearing from Martha Cagle later. Um, so I'm really delighted um, that you're here. This is exciting things. Um, New York City is also making a, a, a great progress. The mayor has announced that our plan is to end veterans' homelessness here in New York City by the end of the year, and you'll be hearing more about that later as well. And I think what really has made progress around the country is that there's been ex an extreme number of resources devoted to this problem. So um, you think that homelessness is an intractable problem. In fact, if you really put your mind to it and if you back it up with resources and the leadership that we need, um, this is President Obama's goal. Um, it's the Secretary of the VA's goal, and, and that's how things happen. And so I'm very excited. You'll be hearing um, lots of good stories today. Um, I'm, I'm going to give, um, I'll probably introduce each speaker individually. Um, and so the first, uh, we're going to hear from Richard Cho from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness first, then Martha Cagle from um, Unity of Greater New Orleans, then we'll hear from Commissioner Sutton um, about what's going on in New York City, and I'm really delighted to have Craig Hines here. He is one of our um, tenants at uh, our Kingsbridge Terrace residence and is a formerly homeless veteran himself and a... Um, a veteran of the wars in both Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm going to start with Richard Cho. Many of you probably know Richard. Um, he worked for 12 years at the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Most recently, he was the direct Director of Innovations. Um, he joined um, the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness in 2013, um, and he is um, the Senior Policy Director for USICH. I always uh, trip over that. Um, Richard holds a undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago and a master's in city planning from MIT. And as, as if that wasn't enough, he's pursuing a doctorate in public administration from NYU. So congratulations. And Richard just got off a whirlwind tour this week with the VA, Department of Labor, and HUD secretary visiting three cities um, in a military jet. So it sounds like it was a busy week. <laughs> so um, everybody, please welcome Richard Cho. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I don't know about you, I'm, I'm feeling like a little bit of an emotional mess after that StoryCorps thing. <laughs> this morning, so I'm just going to you know, try to um, re-energize re a little bit here. Uh, but I think, I think um, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today. Um, as Tori mentioned, I spent a lot of time here in New York City. This is where I cut my teeth and learned everything that I know uh, about what it takes to end homelessness. And I think a lot of the innovations that are happening around the country um, started here, uh, including uh, supportive housing. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, our, our goal of ending veteran homelessness, um, which is, again, not a goal that uh, we consider a federal goal, but a goal that's a national goal uh, that we know we cannot achieve unless we also achieve it in communities. Uh, I'm very excited that, to be here with, with Martha, um, who's already done it and is sustaining that, uh, and uh, had the chance to fly around the country, uh, to join Houston, who's created a system that can house um, any veteran who's experiencing homelessness today and any veteran who should experience housing crisis in the future, uh, and in the fourth largest city in the country with the second highest veteran population. That is no small feat. Uh, and also um, excited to be here with Commissioner General Sutton. Uh, I love using that term. It almost sounds like you, you run the UN or something like that. But, it's, uh, <laughs> but uh, just the commitment here in New York City is fabulous. And if we can get, uh, get to that goal by the end of this year in the largest city in this country, I think that um, there's no excuse why we can't do it everywhere in this country. And then Craig, i um, very excited to hear your story and um, really honored that you're here and want to congratulate you on all of your success. So. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about us. We're, we're a, a federal agency, uh, independent federal agency, and our role is to coordinate the federal response to end homelessness, uh, which consists of the work of 19 different uh, agencies, uh, including members of the cabinet. Uh, and um, if you all think that your job is difficult of trying to herd cats, we also have a difficult job of trying to herd cats across the federal government. Um, but really what our goal is to do is to align and elevate the issue of homelessness within the federal government, uh, and get them all to be rowing in the same direction with regard to the implementation of our uh, federal plan to end homelessness, uh, which is known as Opening Doors. How many folks here have heard of Opening Doors? Great, so uh, Opening Doors, we adopted this plan in 2010 and it really lays out a comprehensive blueprint for how we're gonna end homelessness, uh, not only among veterans, but for all populations. Uh, and uh, we have set four, uh, four goals, uh, which really together are about um, how we end homelessness for all Americans. Uh, but our first and foremost goal is to prevent and end homelessness among veterans by the end of this year. 
Uh, we're also looking to end chronic homelessness. Originally, we, we had thought we could do it by 2015. Uh, we haven't had the same kind of resources investments that we've had for veterans, unfortunately, and so we've had to move that goal to 2017, but we are absolutely committed to achieving that. Uh, we're also working to end homelessness among families, you know, children, and youth by the end of 2020. Uh, and uh, again, the time frame for that was not a reflection of the fact that it's a lower priority, more so the fact that we knew exactly what it takes to end chronic homelessness. We knew exactly what it takes to end veteran homelessness. We just needed the resources uh, and the strategies and implementation to get there. And then families and youth, we've had a lot to learn. And so uh, we've been catching up, uh, but we're still um, uh, working hard to achieve that goal. And again, we want to set a path to end all types of homelessness. Uh, the words on the seal of our agency uh, are and I'm not going to say the Latin correctly, but it's Domicilia Omnibus Americanus, which means homes for all Americans. And that is exactly what we're uh, looking to achieve. Um, so I talked about our goal, uh, our, our plan. Um, I encourage you to look at that. In a couple of weeks, we'll be releasing an amendment to our um, opening doors plan. Uh, and really, it's really tweaks around the edges of, of building and some of the things that we've learned and some of the things that I'll talk about today of really what it takes to end homelessness. Uh, the original plan we adopted in 2010 we, is absolutely the, the right plan with the right strategies. And if anything, we, we needed to just uh, increase uh, kind of some of the, the details with regard to what it takes to retool the crisis response system with regard to the role of Medicaid and the importance of data um, in ending homelessness, which I think has been found to be really critical on our work on veterans. Uh, and when we released that plan, um, I think what we are really doing is re, uh, recommitting, uh, and it's a strong statement from this administration, that we are absolutely committed to achieving an end to homelessness in America. So let me talk a little bit about what an end to homelessness means, because uh, I think uh, many of us, and including myself uh, many years ago, thought that homelessness was not something we could really solve. It's something that we certainly <coughs> wanted to tackle and address, but uh, how can we imagine a day when we could actually end homelessness? Uh, what does that actually mean and look like? And so now we have cities like New Orleans and Houston and other places around the country uh, where you can actually imagine and see oh, tangibly, this is what an end to homelessness looks like. But let me take a step back here and explain to you what that means. So um, as with any tough question, I often go uh, to people like Einstein for some of the answers here. And uh, any folks here, kind of physics, science geeks, anybody? Come on, you can, you, don't, you can, you can admit it. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, you know, there's been a long debate in, uh, in theoretical physics about what is light. And is light a particle or is it a wave? And actually, there's different ways to measure both. And, and you, know, you can actually look at light and it has behaviors that treat it like any kind of a particle at a point in time. It's like something you can actually measure. At the same time, it has wave properties where, um, and, and so there's been this long debate. And, and finally, Einstein just said, let's forget this debate. We have two contradictory pieces of reality, but it's only by looking at them both that we can really understand the whole, that we need to look at this both. And I think that's kind of what ending homelessness is about. It's a duality. It's not only about, uh, trying to reach a number. We want to bring the number of people who experience homelessness down, and it's about um, what is our point in time count? What is our HMIS data? What is our, uh, you have your own data systems in your city. Like, what is the number telling us about how we brought the number down? But it's not only about how we bring the number down at a point in time, it's about how we sustain an end to homelessness so that we have a system in place that can ensure that when anybody experiences housing crisis again in the future, um, uh, they will uh, be able to be rehoused quickly. Um, so we've actually formally defined this, and this is on our website. It will be included in our amendment to the opening doors plan. And I'm sure you can't read this, so I apologize for that. Uh, but what we define an end to homelessness as uh, not uh, the fact that no one's ever going to uh, experience a housing crisis again. We know that with changing economic realities, the uncertainty of life, we know that with youth having family conflicts because of their LGBT status, um, there's always going to be situations where individuals, families, or youth are going to be in situations where they lose housing or they, they don't have stable housing. What an end to homelessness does mean is that in every community across this country, we will have a systematic response in place that can ensure that we can prevent homelessness whenever possible, and if we can't prevent it, that we can make sure that instances of homelessness are rare, brief, and non-recurring. And that means in every community, you have a system that can do four different things. First, that you can identify uh, anybody who's experiencing homelessness or housing crisis quickly and engage them. And two, that you can intervene to prevent the loss of homelessness, uh, uh, loss of housing, um, excuse me, um, or divert them from actually um, needing, needing homeless services by helping them reconnect with housing. Uh, and that we're providing them with access to shelter and crisis services without barriers to entry while helping people connect to housing and services appropriate to their needs and strengths uh, so they can achieve and maintain stable housing on an ongoing basis. Uh, so what does that actually tangibly look like? Well, um, I uh, was going to talk about New Orleans, but I realized Martha's here and she could tell you a lot better than I can. <laughs> but New Orleans was the first major city to announce um, in January of this year that they've effectively ended veteran homelessness. 
Uh, and again, that doesn't mean that there were not veterans um, who are still um, in shelters or on the streets. It does not mean that any veteran will never become homeless. Certainly, we want to try to prevent that and, and try to engage everyone. But what it does mean is that uh, in New Orleans, they had the ability to house everybody within 30 days. They saw a dramatic decrease in the number of veterans experiencing homelessness uh, um, over the past several years. Really, uh, a lot of the credit due to Martha, uh, who's here today. Um, and and, and uh, in, now in, in New Orleans, um, no veteran has to remain homeless um, because they have the ability to actually house them uh, within 30 days. And I, Martha, I think you said you're down to 90, 29 days now, but, 29 but days. <laughs> uh, and that, that's pretty incredible. And as Martha will tell you, it's not just about what they achieved by January of this year, uh, but also the fact that they're sustaining that, they can actually continue to house people. The, the strong commitment of the mayor, Mayor Mitch Landrieu, uh, who made a strong commitment and uh, in, in, in the ambitious way that only Mayor Landrieu can do. He said, I'm not just going to end homelessness uh, in, in the same time frame as everybody else. I'm going to do it a year ahead of everybody. So he actually announced this, uh, this January that he um, had achieved the goal. Uh, and I think it was the commitment on his part to say, and I think he probably called you, Martha, to say, can we actually do this by January of 2014? And she said, absolutely, Mayor. And, and that's, that's what it took. And it brought everybody together. Um, they created a list, comprehensive master list of every veteran that was experiencing homelessness, had outreach workers canvassing the streets, making sure that they had identified every veteran who was experiencing homelessness, and had the whole toolkit of resources. How many folks here are involved in the HUD-VASH program? How many folks here are involved in the SSVF program? How many folks here are in GPD? Right? So we have a whole toolkit of VA resources, and then on top of that, we have a bunch of HUD funding and other community-based resources, and it's about how you use all those tools um, really strategically. And Martha, I'm sure you felt like a switchboard operator at some times where you're trying to figure out how do we get this veteran into this person's unit and, and whatnot. Um, and then uh, this past Monday, as Tori mentioned, I had a chance to fly uh, to three cities within two days uh, with three cabinet secretaries uh, and the entire entourage that we brought with us uh, to join uh, Mayor Anise Parker in, in Houston, uh, where they've announced uh, in the fourth largest city in the country with the second highest veteran population uh, that they've achieved a system that can house uh, veterans. Um, I think they're uh, close to the 30-day mark, uh, and that they've actually housed, um, since 2010, 3,650 uh, 3, veterans uh, and placed them into permanent housing with supportive services, and they can actually sustain that and house, um, I think, about uh, 100 uh, individ uh, veterans a month um, if, they, if they need to. Um, they're about to release their point. Time count numbers, we're expecting to see a pretty dramatic decrease. And again, in Houston, it's not the case that there's no veterans currently experiencing homelessness or that will experience homelessness in the future. Uh, they are working on prevention efforts, but it is the fact that they can house them very quickly. So the minute uh, a veteran announces that they're experiencing housing crisis or homelessness, um, the city has the resources and the capacity to be able to house them uh, immediately. And again, just like uh, in New Orleans, uh, it was the leadership of the mayor that really brought folks together and created that charge uh, and provided the leadership to get that job done. And in Houston, they established a coordinated entry system uh, which enabled them to be able to say on any given day, we have a unit open here, um, this veteran may be better served through SSVF or may be better served through HUD-BASH or maybe we need to use SSVF as a bridge to HUD-BASH or whatnot and they were able to get the job done there. So, so taking what we've learned from New Orleans and taking what we've learned from Houston and taking what we've, we're seeing happen here in New York City uh, and in other parts of the country, Salt Lake City, uh, Phoenix, uh, we've put together a list of what we think are the top 10 things any community needs to do to get to this goal. And I think these are a lot of these things are happening here in New York City. But the first and foremost is, is to start at the top and to recruit your mayor to join uh, the mayor's challenge to end veteran homelessness, which is uh, an effort that uh, the White House and the First Lady, Michelle Obama, has launched uh, uh, in conjunction with several mayors to say, uh, we are all going to commit, uh, work together uh, at the federal, state, local levels, and with community partners uh, to achieve an end to veteran homelessness around the country. And so far, we've had, I think, 470 mayors, uh, eight governors, and a bunch of county executives, so a total of about 600 or so um, local leaders who have signed on to this challenge, and the number continues to grow today. Um, and um, I think having the leadership of a mayor, uh, county executive governor, is often what it takes to bring all the different par parties together and the stakeholders together to say we're going to get this done and to provide that urgency. And I'm sure Martha, when Ma Mayor Landrieu in July of 2014 said we're going to get this job done, that just kind of kicked things into high gear. Um, second is to identify all veterans experiencing homelessness by name. Um, you know, we have big numbers in places like Houston. We have big numbers of veterans experiencing homelessness in New York City. 
But frankly, um, sometimes what it takes is something as simple as finding every veteran and making sure you have a by name list so that you can actually um, say, who's actually reaching out to Joe today? Who's actually, who's actually contacted him? Let's not make sure we're not duplicating efforts here, but let's make sure we are, um, uh, have a coordinated process for helping connect uh, Joe to housing. Um, thir third is to implement a housing first orientation, and that doesn't just mean in support of housing, it doesn't just mean in SSVF, but where we're actually, the whole system is working to figure out how do we get a veteran into stable permanent housing as quickly as possible, and everyone who works from shelter, street outreach, transitional housing, and permanent housing is oriented towards figuring out how do we help a, um, a veteran obtain stable housing and then provide them with the supports to keep them uh, there. Uh, fourth is to set really ambitious short-term housing placement goals um, how do you take a number uh, like 3,000 and bring that number down? Um, how do you take a number like 1,000 and bring that number down? You have to break it down into chunks and manageable parts. And here, uh, sometimes it happens on a monthly basis. Sometimes it happens in a 100-day basis. We say we're going to house 100 veterans in 100 days or, or 50 veterans this month. Uh, and that's, that's been uh, really critical to what it takes. And I know that uh, that's the kind of stuff that's happening here in New York City. Uh, fifth is coordinated outreach and engagement. Uh, outreach is probably one of the most important parts of our crisis response system. It's also unfortunately one of the most underfunded parts of our crisis response system. But uh, we know veterans are sometimes in shelters, sometimes they're out in streets and other places under bridges, and that's, we need to make sure that uh, you cannot claim that you've ended homelessness unless you've made sure that you've made every effort to identify veterans, um, even those who are not uh, in places that are um, easy to find. Um, sixth is to implement coordinated entry systems, and that doesn't necessarily mean um, you have to have uh, one tool and one system, but uh, a process that makes sure that the access to housing is streamlined and that the entire system and the, all, all of you who are working together know at any given day where you can find a housing resource and know what the resources are available and you are able to do essentially what is match.com, right? So you're matching veterans who need housing uh, with, with available housing. The coordinate entry system is, is absolutely match.com. Um, uh, seventh is, is how we deploy the federal resources that we have, HUD, VASH, and SSVF effectively. You know, we've had incredible investments from Congress uh, in ending veteran homelessness and a bipartisan commitment to do so. And, you know, nowhere else in the federal government do you see the kind of investments happen where the HUD, VASH program in 2008 uh, was at a scale of about 10,000 vouchers. Today we have 80,000 authorized vouchers. That's an 800% increase in supportive housing resources for veterans. Yeah, that's worthy of applause. SSVF program, uh, in authorized in, in FY 2011, uh, was at a scale of $50 million. Today, um, there's $400 million, $407 million to be precise, that is deployed currently. Uh, so you have a huge growth in the amount of SSVF resources that provide rapid rehousing and homelessness prevention services. We've, we have flooded communities with a ton of resources um, to the best of our ability at the federal level. And our job now is to figure out how do we deploy those resources quickly? How do we get the money in the hands of communities who really know how to use those resources? And at the community level, are we making sure we're making effort to utilize those? I know that New York City just got a big award of HUD-VASH vouchers, and, and are you making sure that you can utilize every single voucher that's available? Because we have that responsibility to make sure that if we have the resources in place, that we need to help uh, veterans um, access those resources. Um, eighth is to improve transitional housing uh, performance. Uh, again, we have uh, programs like GPD and other transitional housing uh, that um, can be a critical part of the crisis response system of helping um, either serve a bridge to permanent housing um, or help veterans get connected to the employment services and, and other um, support so that they can actually obtain permanent housing on their own. And the key is we got a lower barrier so people can get into that transitional housing and then make, move them through quickly into permanent housing and not uh, extend their length of time that they have to stay there. Ninth is the increased connections to employment as uh, Secretary Tom Perez of the Department of Labor said in Houston, Tucson, and, and Las Vegas this week, he said, you know, the best inoculation against homelessness is to have a steady job and, and, and a living wage. Uh, and uh, he is absolutely committed to doing everything in his part to make sure that through programs like Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program, anybody here, HVRP? Awesome. Um, HVRP, which has really fantastic um, uh, employment placement outcomes, as well as all the mainstream American job centers that we're using those resources to help veterans uh, obtain employment. Uh, and last but not least is coordinating with Im illegal services. I don't know how much of that is a part of what you're doing here, but legal services not only to try to reduce the barriers to housing, uh, but also to help um, veterans in some cases uh, kind of uh, review their discharge status. There are veterans out there who can qualify uh, for VA services if they can get their um, discharge status reviewed. So uh, there's a huge role that legal services can play uh, in helping overcome barriers to housing as well as to get the benefits that they need. 
Um, so let me talk quickly, I'm sorry if I'm taking a little bit long, but we're, um, let me talk a little bit about how we at the federal level are working to achieve this goal. Uh, is first that we are supporting left, uh, efforts at the community level. Uh, let, me, let me talk through each of these. So uh, there's a picture here um, from Monday when we went to Houston and announced with uh, Anise Parker that they've achieved a system to house any veteran uh, who is experiencing or at risk of homelessness in the future. And there you see HUD Secretary Julian Castro, um, VA Secretary Bob McDonald, uh, and Labor Secretary Tom Perez, and my boss Matthew Doherty, um, there with us. And uh, everything that we know is that we can't achieve this goal until we do it locally. And so we've been out trying to support communities in every, every single way we, we can. Uh, and that's through a series of tools that we've released. Uh, we've released a, a tool that lays out those 10 strategies. Uh, we've released a, a tool for helping uh, identify and refer veterans. Um, you know, it, it takes an all of community response to end veteran homelessness. Uh, we need every, every part of the crisis response system. We need hospitals, we need jails, everybody looking for veterans who, could, who are experiencing homelessness and qualify. And we've we released a kind of quick guide to identifying and, and um, helping refer veterans to assistance. Uh, we've also established criteria for what it, it means to end homelessness. Um, we are hoping very soon when New York City is there, I'm looking at Nicole and Allison and, a few, and, and Tori and uh, Commissioner Sutton and a few others here, when you all are ready to say that we've actually done this, uh, we at the federal government are, are absolutely um, able to help validate what you've done. And um, I, I'm looking forward uh, to bringing the full weight of the White House and, and the cabinet to come celebrate with you when you've achieved the goal. Um, I mentioned already the, the HUD Bash Awards and the SSVF um, surge that's out there right now, a lot of resources on the streets. Uh, right now we know that one of the challenges, and maybe not in New York City, but in other places, is that um, in order for us to be able to use every single HUD Bash voucher, um, we need to make sure that uh, there's uh, all the, the VA case management positions are hired. Uh, and we know there's vacancies in a lot of places around the country. So there's been a big commitment from Secretary McDonald to make a big push. And they have a goal of hitting uh, a 90 percent um, filled rate for the HUD bash um, uh, case managers by uh, June 30th of this year. Uh, in addition, a letter just went out from um, HUD to public housing authorities that there's a number of different strategies that they can pursue to also increase HUD bash utilization, including tapping into a, a $10 million extraordinary admin fee pool. It's a very wonky thing. Uh, essentially what it is is um, PHAs who need to make a big push on HUD bash utilization, uh, as well as other voucher utilization, but in particular HUD bash, can apply to HUD for uh, um, some of these ex extraordinary admin fees, and they can use that to pay for things like housing search assistance, uh, to pay for help with processing vouchers. Um, so, so absolutely something that they should, you all should consider here. And finally, um, we've also realized that in some communities uh, where they've actually ended uh, chronic veteran homelessness, so there are no more veterans who are experiencing chronic homelessness, and we've made a, a big push to make sure that HUD bash vouchers are being uh, used, uh, at 65% of those vouchers are being used for chronically homeless veterans, that in some communities where there are no more chronic homeless veterans left, uh, we want to provide the flexibility to let communities use HUD bash for other high need populations. And so um, HUD is, is going to release soon uh, a targeting exemption so that communities um, who've ended chronic homelessness among veterans uh, can then uh, use HUD bash to serve other priority populations and the, and the guidance will outline um, what that looks like. Um, we're also pushing to use other federal resources. It's not just about HUD and VA programs, but uh, coordinating with um, HHS programs, Healthcare for the Homeless, PATH grantees, SAMHSA's grantees. Anybody here from, from PATH or Healthcare for the Homeless? Okay, so that's probably something you all want to connect with because there are many veterans being served currently through Healthcare for the Homeless programs. Uh, and try, again, leveraging employment services. Uh, and then one thing I just want to mention quickly is um, we also know that we have a duty to make sure that veterans who are coming back from the current conflicts and from uh, recent service um, in, uh, in, Afga in Afghanistan and Iraq um, are actually being prevented from experiencing homelessness. So one of the things we've been doing is working with Department of Defense and, and uh, VA to make sure that as transitioning service members um, are leaving the Department of Defense that we are asking them about um, housing and whether they have a viable housing plan. And if they say no, that we are immediately proactively connecting them with uh, VA's homelessness um, services and homeless prevention services. And I know that that's not something that has happened uh, in the past and that is just a, a tragedy and that is a failure on the part of the federal government to do our uh, responsibility to make sure that um, as service members um, transition to the community that they're prevented from homelessness. We are fixing that and uh, I wanna make sure that if you hear stories about people who've come back um, from service recently and who fall into homelessness and are not assisted with VA, that uh, um, you, should, you should definitely contact me or other members of the administration. We will absolutely uh, figure out how we can help that. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we know that there are veterans out there who don't qualify for VA programs. Uh, and so we're working hard to both clarify 
um, who is eligible for VA programs and services and who is not. Uh, we put out, we're actually in the next day or so going to put out this very quick guide. It's a flow chart to just help you figure out what, um, should you serve a veteran through um, HUD VASH, SSVF, GPD, um, or other VA programs, or is it better to maybe think about HUD's uh, resources or your local um, resources? Uh, and then uh, meanwhile, we're also, um, HUD is going to be releasing some guidance uh, around how um, veterans who are not eligible for VA programs and services should be, should be eligible um, for, uh, for HUD continuum of care, public housing authority resources, as well as HHS programs, uh, and that um, veterans who are not eligible should be connected to legal services, as I mentioned again, to see if they can get their discharge status reviewed. So uh, sorry to go on for a, a bit long. I wanted to give you a, a global sense of what we're doing. We are working hard every single day to figure out how we can push hard on um, ending veteran homelessness and getting to this goal. This is something that our president has made a very firm commitment on, that he wants to achieve an end to veteran homelessness by the end of this year. And uh, he's, he's um, told the members of this administration that we are going to do this and um, let him know what he needs to do, but also to, to uh, make this final push. Um, so let me say, uh, we, we take that commitment very seriously and um, want to figure out everything we can do to help um, places, um, in particular like places like New York City and other parts of New York State um, who are trying to achieve this goal, because um, we, we firmly believe uh, that no veteran should ever have to experience homelessness in this country and that we can do better by this. And, and uh, let, let me just also say that we know that if we can end homelessness for veterans, that shows that we can absolutely end homelessness for all Americans in this country and that we have commitment and the obligation to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really excited that Martha's here. She's kind of a, a rock star among um, the world in, of veterans homelessness because of the work that she's done in New Orleans. I'm really glad that she could make it up here. Um, Martha is an attorney and executive director of Unity of Greater New Orleans, which is a collaborative of 60 agencies that work to address homelessness in that community. Um, they, uh, for their work in, in, um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, they received the, they were the 2010 recipient of the nonprofit award by the National Alliance to End Homelessness. So I know that was a big crisis for you. And um, so uh, I think she, she's gonna, uh, sorry, Richard talked a little bit about the partnership with the mayor and how they were able to end homelessness. So, so Unity now is in charge of maintaining the functional zero that she's gonna talk about. And so that's a very important role. Um, and they're down to less than 30 days uh, when a veteran becomes homelessness to get them into housing. Um, Martha is a graduate of Stanford Law School, a former Skadden Fellow, and she served as a law clerk for the Chief Judge of the Federal Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Sorry, that was a mouthful. Um, she has worked for the ACLU, and um, she was also a recipient of a Public Interest Award from Louisiana State Bar Association. So please join me in welcoming Martha. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here. <clears throat> I feel like we, this is such a synergistic movement where we all, all are building on what we learn from one another. And I really want to acknowledge um, the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, which truly was our guru in uh, uh, going through these uncharted waters of uh, trying to figure out how to get to zero. And also, I want to acknowledge Allison with the City of New York, who's really been an inspiration and uh, Community Solutions, uh, Common Ground Community, has been um, a steadfast partner of Unity ever since, uh, even before Katrina, really, but has really helped us put a lot of things into place um, that made it possible for us to get to zero, uh, in um, functional zero on veteran homelessness. <clears throat> so people are always asking me, you know, what was your big secret? Passion? and you have enough determination. And you are gonna need huge amounts of both. Because what's been most shocking to me as we bore down on getting to zero, and I know Allison already knows this and many of you already are very familiar with this, what's shocking is how much resistance you get. The resistance comes from people that you would never believe are resistant to this. Some of it is people who are concerned that if you get to a functional zero, their funding will disappear. Some of it are just people who don't believe that this is possible because um, you know, we have to explain what functional zero means. Except in the very smallest communities, you're never actually gonna get to a day where you have zero veterans. So it is about 
getting to the point where you have housed everyone on your master list uh, except the people that just came into the system and that going forward you're going to house them within probably 30 days is the goal that I think most communities are setting. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a functional zero. As long as there is no right to housing in this country, we are going to be dealing with the fact that veterans are particularly vulnerable to being pitched into homelessness and so there's always going to be a few. And, uh, but, but what we're talking about is a functional zero. So there's resistance about that, people not believing that you can do it. But there's also just resistance to prioritizing resources differently. Um, there's resistance to picking up the pace because this is a tremendous amount of work. There is resistance to just doing things differently from the way that we've always done them. And so you're going to be dealing with a lot of resistance in, in case you haven't experienced that yet. That is what's ahead. Um, and so, you know, what is really key is that we all buy into the, to the idea that getting to zero on veteran homelessness is our responsibility. And I have a confession to make. I didn't realize that it was my responsibility. Yes, our organization was housing lots and lots of veterans. But getting to zero on all veteran uh, homelessness, I kind of thought that was sort of the VA's responsibility. I didn't really grasp that it was my responsibility too. And it's the responsibility of everybody in this room. And unless you feel that responsibility personally, you're not really going to be able to get to zero. So I'm going to start the same way I started many of our meetings when we were working on the last getting to zero campaign, that last six month campaign. And I would start the meetings by asking, how many of you are veterans? Raise your hand. How many of you are veterans? We have a good representation of veterans here, but it's definitely a minority. Most of us, like me, we never served in the military. And what we really need to keep in mind is that Veterans <clears throat> disproportionately came from modest circumstances. And they disproportionately did not have the choices when they were young adults that most of us did. And that, mod those modest circumstances that they came from is the major reason why they are vulnerable to homelessness today. We have to really understand the social injustice of veterans being homeless. And we have to really feel that deeply, that that is just wrong. It is wrong that I didn't serve in the military because I didn't have to. And other people did, and one of the reasons, many of them did just because they wanted to serve. Others, disproportionately, they didn't really have that many choices. And yes, they wanted to serve, but they also didn't have that many choices not to serve. And so they not only served and went through all the inconvenience and of that, but they risked their lives. Even if they never served in combat, they risked their lives because they could have been called up and had to, serve, and had to risk their life and had to be in combat. And so there is something so profoundly wrong about the fact that as a country, we would allow people who did that for us so that most of us didn't have to do that. We would allow them to have to use the sidewalk as their pillow, to have to lie awake at night for fear that someone's going to rob them or rape them or attack them if they close their eyes, that we would allow them to have to forage in dumpsters for food like they're animals when they did that for us. And we, we gladly allowed them to do that for us so we didn't have to do it. So, you know, this is something I think we all need to remind our, ourselves of constantly in order to get this job done, that this is just a fundamental injustice and we cannot tolerate it. We just cannot tolerate it. And if you can maintain that passion about this being a moral issue, it's an issue of injustice, it's a social justice issue, then you can get this done. And that is the major secret I have to impart to you, is that you have to keep that injustice 
at the forefront. So it's very exciting work. I cannot tell you how exciting it is to be able to bring these veterans home after what they've done for us. It's just so emotional. It's so rewarding. Um, but the other thing is when you finally get to your functional zero, which will be a different number for every community, you realize it's like the, the scales have fallen off your eyes. You suddenly realize we can do this for every subpopulation. We can do this for families. We can do this for people with disabilities. We can do this for youth. We can do this for everybody. You start realizing that it is possible. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying we'll be able to do it all tomorrow. But we can see now that we are probably close to being able to do this for families. And we can definitely see that we'll be able to, do, to end chronic homelessness uh, definitely before uh, the federal deadline, we believe. So that's the exciting thing about this, is that um, you know, you're writing a social injustice, but you're also finally seeing that we can really uh, achieve a day when hopefully nobody is homeless longer than 30 days. So where did, where did we come from? New Orleans had uh, probably one of the very highest per capita rates of homelessness veteran homelessness and homelessness generally in the country. And that was really a fallout of Hurricane Katrina. Um, and so we're only a city of 379,000 people. So we're not a very big city. But um, in 2011, we had 420 unsheltered uh, veterans, unsheltered, lying outside. <clears throat> and we had 50 in emergency shelter. We don't have that much emergency shelter, so it's different from New York. And in our uh, January, late January 2015 point in time, this is what functional zero now looks like. We have had 15 veterans in emergency shelter and 12 uh, that were on the street on that night. And that is a 94% decline. Uh, we're hoping that by next point in time, the number will actually be a little smaller than that. But it's probably not, never going to be zero because we do, have a veter we do have a very high rate of poverty in New Orleans. And veterans, because of poverty and disability, are vulnerable to, to homelessness. But I, I really believe that if New Orleans can do this, uh, that any city can do it. Um, we not only had a high per capita rate of homelessness, but we have no resources to address this issue uh, from the government other than federal pass-through funds and the contribution that our state makes to Medicaid. Um, so there really aren't any other resources. We, we really had to be creative about how we sequenced federal resources to be able to do this. Um, and the other thing is that when you're actually, you know, getting into your last getting to zero campaign, um, you are dealing with the veterans that you've never been able to house in all previous campaigns. So it really is a challenge to get down to that final number. It's a lot harder to, to, to house the last 500 people than it was the 500 people before them because they include people who are very, very resistant uh, along with others who aren't resistant. Um, but, it, but it is a very, um, interesting challenge. So let me start by uh, talking a little bit more about the functional zero because it really is important to um, explain what we mean uh, just so that you overcome the doubters. Ending homelessness in New Orleans, ending veteran homelessness in New Orleans meant that we provided permanent housing to all veterans living on the streets in an emergency shelter who could be located and who would accept housing. And we weren't passive about the locating part. We actively worked every day to find them, making sure that we were uh, identifying every veteran in shelter and going out on the street every night, every weeknight at least, uh, to find uh, veterans on the street. We also did uh, two many point in times on the street every month just to make sure that we were getting everybody. And so the last part of our campaign, we permanently housed 227 veterans in uh, six months who were actually living on the streets or in emergency shelter. We did have nine veterans who adamantly refused housing, 
so their cases were rolled over into the Functional Zero Initiative, but that didn't mean we gave up on them. You can refuse housing, and we still, you're still our client, even if you don't realize you are. <laughs> um, and I'm happy to say that of the nine that refused during the Getting to Zero campaign, we have housed five of those since then. So our definition of maintaining a functional zero is that every newly discovered veteran living on the streets or an emergency shelter is provided permanent housing with an average of 30 days of finding them, unless they choose to enter a longer-term treatment program instead. Um, we uh, are still doing those periodic uh, mini point-in-time uh, style nighttime surveys. And so SFVF agencies are really on the front line of this, and UNI maintains uh, the, the coordination of the whole system. The thing is, as Thomas Jefferson said, uh, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. What we've discovered is that eternal vigilance is the price of ending veteran homelessness. Mm -hmm. so this is our job forevermore. We are going to be doing this work every day and every night uh, from there on. And here's what we've accomplished so far. Since January 2nd, when we reached the functional zero uh, by housing the 227th homeless veteran on our master list, we've permanently housed an additional 55 homeless veterans. Actually, it's five of those who've adamantly refused housing. And the average length of time is 29 days. The median length of time is much shorter, 16 days, a little more than two weeks. Um, and the reason why the different, there's such a difference between the median and the average is because those resistant folks uh, you know, have pulled down the average. You know, we're counting the first day we ever met them as um, the, the length of time. <clears throat> so going back to how we um, accomplish the goal of getting to zero in the first place, um, a really key part of this is the mayor's leadership. And in a city where you, your mayor is just now able to play that role, I would recommend that you find somebody else who's a very powerful, popular person uh, to lead the cause. Because you're going to need someone who really can bring uh, all the parties to the table and overcome um, any kind of resistance that, that um, people might have. Um, so in our case, in New Orleans, the mayor um, set the deadline, and having that intense deadline is really key to actually accomplishing the goal of getting to functional zero. And Unity, my organization, which is the um, lead agency for the continuum of care, we're a nonprofit, we were called upon basically to come up with a strategy for how to do this. Um, the mayors, uh, we had three weekly meetings, three different groups met every week. The mayor convened a leadership team and one of his staff members led it, and that was all the different entities that um, had uh, housing resources, so it included the VA, the housing authority, we as the continuum of care, the state, um, and, uh, and SFVF. And then uh, we had also a meeting of the veteran housing navigators every week, and then we had a meeting of uh, my key staff that were sort of uh, coordinating each of the other two uh, uh, groups uh, to make sure that they were uh, communicating with one another and that we were properly supervising the, the uh, navigators. Uh, the second key step was this idea of one master list. One master list. Not everybody keeping their own list, but one master list. And you only get credit for participating in this campaign if you're housing people off this master list. In order to have one master list, you really need to have really strong street outreach because it really only works well if you already know all the veterans out there on the street since the VA has trouble sharing that information because of the legal restrictions that they're, they're under. Um, they're going to have a few people that the continuum of care won't know about. But if you have a really strong street outreach team, you should know virtually all of their, their people. Um, the master list is dynamic. It's never closed. We got a lot of resistance to that idea because it made it the task very huge, and it was very difficult to predict where it was all going to end. 
So people were always wanting to close the list, and we just kept insisting that we couldn't say we had ended veteran homelessness if we did not maintain this list every day and open it up to whoever came into the system every day. That is really important. The list has to be both inclusive, it has to, you have to be confident that you have everybody on this list, that you have very aggressive outreach, that you have a very comprehensive process of identifying every veteran in the shelters, and that you're doing it every day. But it also, you have to make sure it's not over-inclusive, and that's just an important an idea. You can't have people adding people to this list who aren't literally homeless. And there will be a lot of pressure to do that. Um, but if you're going to use your resources well, and you have scarce resources, I don't think there's any community that has too many resources, um, you're going to have to make sure that you've really verified that the people on this list have actually served in the military, not necessarily by the VA health care system's definition, but just that they've served a day in the military. We don't care whether they got a dishonorable discharge or not, but we do care did they serve a day in the military. Um, and you have to make sure that they're literally homeless and that that's documented by independent resources, not just self-verification and not family members and not even well-meaning social service organizations that haven't actually seen them sleeping outside. So that's what we mean by really having a, a master list that has a lot of integrity. So I'm going to kind of speed this up because I think I'm <clears throat> running short on time. But Having really good communication between the VA and the continuum of care is really critical to this process. I suspect in a lot of communities that comes down to finding out who the right person is in the VA. Um, and for us, it really took this campaign of getting to zero, the last six months campaign, to really get the VA to really identify the right person. Because the people that are on the front lines um, actually running the VASH program um, you know, they want to be helpful, but they may not be high enough up in the hierarchy to really kind of get over all the bureaucratic barriers and give us the data that we need. We needed to have the VA's commitment to, within 24 hours, uh, tell us whether a person had, was in their computer as having served in the military. We didn't stop there because their computer's not fail safe. And so if somebody was insisting that they were a veteran and they weren't showing up in the VA's computer, then we still went and applied for their DD-214 and looked to see if they had any other documentation. I think there was a couple cases where people weren't showing up in their computer, but yet they were getting VA benefits. So obviously they were a veteran or there was something, some kind of bizarre fraud going on. Um, but really increasing that communication to the point where it's daily communication and you can really rely on the data is absolutely essential uh, to getting the job done. Um, fourth is just creating more housing, precisely targeting existing housing. One strategy that we really used in New Orleans was because we don't have any um, service dollars that are just kind of sitting out there to be tapped that aren't already tied to um, housing. So in order to create enough housing resources, we got our housing authority to um, commit vouchers that we could use for people who were ready uh, to, some people call it graduate from COC PSH, meaning that they were very stable and they no longer needed in-home services. Uh, they still needed affordable housing, but they didn't necessarily need a case manager coming on site anymore. And so they were allowed to uh, stay in place in the same apartment, but uh, a housing authority voucher picked up um, a share of their rent. And then that space was freed up for a veteran. And that was really essential to our uh, success, was having, having those additional resources. Other than that, um, we were basically using uh, pre-existing resources, um, but we really, focused on getting the SFVF system to work properly and to really focus on people who were literally homeless in a way that um, they hadn't been fully doing before. Okay, I'm going to mention finding the unsheltered veterans because I imagine in many of your, your communities you do have a lot of unsheltered veterans. 
Um, in order for this to work, you really have to put resources in um, outreach, street outreach. And I know New York City does that. Uh, you have been role models for us on that. Um, but it's really, I think, a problem around the country. Um, and it really is a big barrier to ending veteran homelessness. We have to invest more dollars in street outreach or we can't be sure that we're finding the veterans out there um, and that we're able to successfully persuade them to move off the street, which can be a long process. I mean, veterans have learned how to be very successful in living outside. They have a lot of skills that I don't have. And, um, you know, you've got some folks out there that have really created bunkers and they've, they've set, set up housekeeping for a good long time and you're gonna need some really skilled outreach workers to be able to persuade them that maybe living inside would be a better thing to do. Um, so that is really uh, critical. We also used um, active duty military as volunteers um, in our twice a month, uh, many point in time um, scouring of the city looking for veterans living outside. And I would recommend that to other communities. Um, if you don't have professional outreach team, I think you could still do this, but you need, you need to get all the volunteers that are involved in your um, point in time count to help out with it. Because you, unless you're going out there looking, on a regular basis and really doing a comprehensive scouring of your city, you can't be sure that you've actually found everybody, and that's critical. Whoops. Um, so I mentioned the navigation. Okay. Um, the next thing, I, the, one of the last things I want to mention is this idea of coordinating federal housing resources, and the USICH was really helpful to us in this. Um, you need to figure out in a community like ours, which I suspect is typical of much of America, although not New York State, how you can sequence federal resources in ways that they haven't widely done. So for example, we needed to figure out a seamless way of getting people from SFVF to VASH. We needed to figure out a way for, to get people from SFVF to COC PS, PSH. Um, we needed to um, figure out where, and we got permission through, with help from the USICH. The most exciting thing in many ways about this initiative is that we learned that as fast as we thought we had gotten about housing people, that we could do it faster under that deadline pressure. We actually got to the point where we were housing people within one to three days after finding them, wow. um, which we had never done that before, but it's amazing what deadline pressure can do. And they were still given choices. It wasn't like we were, but we had just, you know, uh, we had just identified and pre-inspected uh, so many apartments, and we had so many landlords uh, willing to step up with the publicity about this initiative that the whole community came together, and we're still doing it. So thank you so much, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you, Martha. That, uh, it's really inspirational to us. Um, you're very, uh, we, of course, New York City is very different than New Orleans. We have our own challenges here. Um, we're a much larger city. Um, on the other hand, though, we have a, a, a very large shelter uh, system, so we're able to more easily identify veterans. So, um, sorry, this isn't working. Um, you know, one of the things that Martha talked about was how important passion is to this work. And I think um, you heard from Commissioner Sutton this morning, and I think that's one word that you could definitely use to describe um, Commissioner Sutton. You probably heard her bio this morning, um, so I won't go into it again, but she's a retired Brigadier General, which is so cool, and also a doctor, um, a psychiatrist, I believe. And so she really brings a very unique perspective to this work and very relevant as well. Um, so I'm just going to, is it here? And I'll, with no further ado, Commissioner Lori Sutton. Thank you so much. Okay. Listen, y'all, thank you so much, Tori. And Richard, thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Martha, what an inspiration. Thank you for sharing the wisdom and the experience from New Orleans. And I will tell you, just looking out both over the crowd earlier this morning as well as now everyone here in this room, it really is heartwarming. And I'm looking now at uh, several of our teammates here in the city. We've got uh, 
Allison Zickman, uh, one of our co-chairs for the Veterans Task Force, Nelsie Santana from the Department of Homeless Services, and of course Nicole Branca here with the Supportive uh, Housing Network of New York City. I will tell you, gang, two things. One is this is a slide deck that was put together by our uh, Veterans Task Force Project Home, and thank you, Nicole and Allison and and uh, Nelsie for, for putting that together. But I also realize that at this point, we have the opportunity to hear from a veteran who's the reason that we are all here. So what we're going to do, if it's okay with you all, we're gonna snap through this slide deck. I will pick out one point from each slide and then I am going to defer to Craig so he can come up and we can maximize the chance to hear about his story. And I am also going to slip out because I just got word that a meeting with the first deputy mayor at City Hall has been moved up, precisely aimed at ending veteran homelessness in New York City with Commissioner Taylor. So how's that sound? Is that a deal? Okay, let's go. Oh, that's me. What do I do here? I've got the arrow at the bottom. Go into the right? Yeah. Okay, good. I think I'm trainable. We'll see. All right, so here's the Veterans Task Force. Okay, so what's the most important point on this slide? That we exist and we're well led and we've got all kinds of passion and plans and work that's going on. Okay, great. Our executive committee, you can see these are all the great folks. Nobody gets where they're going alone. Look at all these great organizations and individuals. Okay, early progress. <laughs> We like lines that are going down when it comes to ending veteran homelessness. You can see the work that's been done here. We're very proud of it, and we're not done yet. Okay, recent progress, last 18 months alone. Okay, we'll just say reduced overall veteran homelessness by 41%. You know, if you can do it, if you can make it happen in New York City, you know, like the old song says, you can make it anywhere. And uh, I would point to you, there was a great... Uh, Huffington uh, Post blog recently, Christopher Mathias, who, who said, you know, is it really possible to end veteran homelessness in New York City? Well, it's happening. Functional zero. Okay, we know that. We know in New York that it's functional zero. We get about 100 veterans into the system every month, so we know that we've got to have no more than 300 veterans in our system, and we want to get them placed within 90 days. Not easy, but you know, if it was easy, it would have been done before, right? Okay, so implementation plan, we are on it all of the things that have been said already. No secrets here, yes, vigilance. There's no question. Vigilance, eternal vigilance is critical. Teamwork, partnerships, mayoral uh, leadership. And I will tell you, our mayor, Bill de Blasio, when he came out earlier this year in his State of the City address and said we are ending chronic veteran homelessness in New York City this year, it is our moral imperative there were a lot of applause lines during the course of his State of the City address, but none were so heartfelt and full of conviction from the audience shared by our city than when he spoke about the moral imperative to end veteran homelessness. Moving forward, yeah, we're moving forward. We got challenges, we got strengths. Good, check, okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> First of all, we're not in this alone. We know we can turn to the federal government and the, the council. We know that we can turn to our neighbors across the country. We know that we've got great folks here all across this city, all across the state. And may I present to you now the reason this is work worth doing. Craig, please come up and share your story. Oh, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Sutton. Um, just so you know that all these PowerPoints will be available on the Supportive Housing Network website. So we have made a lot of progress in New York. Um, and so thank you, Commissioner Sutton, for your leadership on that. Um, the, Craig is one of the reasons that we're all here. Um, I think that um, I'm sure that many of you in the audience work with homeless veterans. And every homeless veteran is unique and has a unique story, as every homeless person's story is unique. Um, I think one thing that I really learned about working with veterans is that there are some unique um, yet, yet common um, stories among veterans that, that is unique to their homelessness as opposed to a non-veteran becoming homeless. And I think that um, as Craig tells his story, and we're going to kind of do an interview back and forth here since 
it's hard to do a PowerPoint, I guess, about your life kind of an experience. <laughs> we didn't want to have to put him through that. Um, so we're going to kind of do a back and forth here, but I think um, you'll see that um, Craig is, 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 uh, has a unique story, but it's also, uh, there's a lot of themes, and he is a real leader at Jericho Project. He's the, he lives at our Kingsbridge Terrace Veterans Residence, and he is the head of the Tenant Council there. Um, he came to Albany with our Supportive Housing Network Lobby Day and was really, um, all the elected officials that met him were so impressed with his story and what, what um, the success that he's had. So um, without further ado, um, Craig Hines, he, is a, um, uh, he was in the U.S. Navy and he served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So Craig, I, I wonder if you could start off by telling us about your military service, how you came to be in the military and what your role was in the military and where you served. <clears throat> Good morning. First, I would like to say thank you to everyone on the panel, everyone in the audience for all the hard work you've done and will do in the future. Thank you. Well, I was living in Atlanta, 2005. I was laid off from my job. At the time, I was a social worker working for the Department of Family and Children's Services. I had two daughters to feed and things were looking bad. So one of the best decisions that I ever made was to join the United States Navy. While in the service, I was a hospital corpsman, which you may not know, but is a medical assistant in the civilian world, and I was also a pharmacy technician. And during my two tours, I, was, I worked hand in hand with the Marines, all the Marines and all the tragic stories I was with the Marines, definitely. Okay. Um, so um, you were in the military for four years, I believe. Yes. Um, what What was it like when you came home? What happened, kind of, during the first six to twelve months that you that you got that you were home? It It was a It was a huge shock, shell shock, shock of environment. Um, while going into the military, the first thing they do with you, they put you in boot camp. You, they take away all your civilian tendencies. They program you how they need you to be, how to save lives, and how to be productive in the military. Unfortunately, on the way out, you do not get the same amount of training. You do not get adjusted to the real world. Unfortunately, when I came home, it was very hard for me to get adjusted to the civilian world. I realized that I've, I changed in the four years that I was in the military, and my family changed. That was huge, and I realized the world changed. And when I came out, it was extremely difficult for me to function normally and for me to find people who understood what I was going through and for me to get help. It was, it was really hard just doing normal things. and. I think they get us a little bit spoiled in the military because, you know, we need something when we know where to get it or somebody else does. When I came out, it was a total different experience. I know that it's discouraging when you try to go to several different agencies or several different places to attempt to get help. You get different answers. And when you deal with, how can I say this? Veterans understand veterans. Military people understand military people. A lot of these agencies, when you come out, they don't really understand you. They don't understand what you're going through. So it's hard to relate and hard to get them to understand what you need and what you're going through. So it was, it was really hard for me just, just adjusting the day-to-day -day functions. Career into a civilian career? And if not, why not? <laughs> Unfortunately, even though while in the military with the Marines, I could save lives, give medicine. Unfortunately, that, those military credentials do not transfer into the civilian world. And we do not know that at all. We are under the grand impression that we can come out and just fall right into whatever we were doing when we fall into the military. It's not so. So you come out, and I'm saying, okay, well, I can work in the hospital to try to keep things going until I do what I want to do, get into school, et cetera. And I find out that I don't have the proper credentials in New York State or in the U.S. or to do whatever I was just finished doing. So that is very discouraging, and I don't think we are prepared for that at all. We just think we're going to get out, get a job. You think everybody's veteran-friendly, and it's not so at all. 
I think that's what a lot of civilians don't realize is, you know, Craig was um, working under, you know, in a combat hospital situations, um, you know, saving Marines' lives, and he, he came out of the military, and he's not actually allowed to be a medical assistant um, in the civilian world, which um, hopefully that's something that our country will take a look at. Um, so I know that you, you had originally gone back to Atlanta when you left the military, and then you came up to New York, which is where you're originally from. Um, tell us about how you found um, finally the resource in Jericho that, that was able to get you housed and, um, and you know, your other experience in New York when you came up. Well, a lot of people ask me, why did I move back to New York? Because everybody's trying to leave. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I love New York. Unfortunately, in Atlanta, they're not very veteran friendly. I came out of the military, and I believe they may have two or three hospitals in the whole state. Every time you try to get benefits, you get overwhelmed by just the population, the people. And then you have certain attitudes that, that go along with when you finally get to the worker, the worker overworked, overstressed, underpaid, and don't understand that you still have PTSD going on. You still have issues going on that are unresolved. Um, when I first moved back to Atlanta, I was living with my mother, and she was happy for me to be home. Everything was good. Unfortunately, with me having a hard time finding benefits, finding which direction to go, how to get into school, the little money that I had in the military quickly diminished. And at that point, our relationship strained. So with not having any other options, I decided maybe I can go to New York. Uh, I still remember the day I called my grandmother and I was like, please, I have nowhere to go. So she allowed me to come up there, come to New York. I moved to New York, I stayed with my, grandfather, my grandmother for a while, and um, she allowed me to stay there until her, she herself was fed up because she felt like I wasn't being progressive and I wasn't doing anything. But I, I understand that she doesn't understand, like she didn't understand, they don't know, it's a long process at the VA, they don't know that we still have issues going on in our head. They don't know that we can just jump out and get back into the world and function. They, they, don't, they don't know. Our family isn't trained to deal with us after we just finished combat or just finished in the military at all. So I can't really be mad at them, but those were the, those were the circumstances that led me to be homeless. And I ended up in a shelter. And fortunately for me, I went to the Bronx VA and I must say, they were very helpful. I met some good people there, and I actually bumped into, this is what I love about the military, I actually bumped into a friend from boot camp who was working at the VA. And I was telling him, you know, I have, I have nowhere to live, I'm trying to get into school. And he brought me to the social work on the fifth floor. Her name is Brenda. And I remember we ran through all the options, and then she said something about Jericho Project. And I was like, tell me about that one. She's like, it's veterans. She made it sound real well. And um, I decided to follow that avenue. That was the best avenue for me, but it was through the VA and other veterans where I actually found some direction and I found Jericho. And I found out there was a lot of homeless veterans and this is a huge problem. But that was, that was, that was, really, that was really good because I don't know, I could have five people tell me to do something, but when, my, when a fellow vet told me to do it, it just like, something just kicked in, and I moved, and it's a, it was a great experience. I've, I've done a total 180 since, since moving into Jericho. Great. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing now and um, about your family? And... Well, currently, after moving into Jericho, currently I am enrolled in school. I'll graduate this year, psychology major. <laughs> Currently, my family or my, my relationship with my family is good because after joining Jericho, supporting housing is excellent because they have people right there who can help you. I have counselors who I see every day. I can talk to me, 
helped me with any situation. I was able to get myself together, get my resume together, find out how I need to get into school. Got into school and now my family has seen the progress that they wanted to see. And they see me getting the help along with me getting psychiatric help, help from counselors, help in school. And the hugest help is a place to live, a place that I know is secure, is totally mine. And I have people who are, who are willing to help me every day. And that's, that's an awesome feeling. Um. Thank you, Craig, for sharing your story. And I know that um, you know Craig is really not just here to share his story, but he's also here to educate people. And um, one of the things I asked him to, to kind of prepare is what are um, kind of what are three things that we can take away today that, that, that we can do in our work, whether it's policy work or direct service care with veterans, um, that, uh, that, that we should know about three things that um, he's, he's seen. Definitely, I, um, I like a lot of points that, uh, that Mr. Chu brought up. They were definitely amazing. Um, I myself thought about, <clears throat> what if when I came out of the military, I had a, a transition place where I, where, I would, where I could go? I could slowly decompress from military to civilian. Uh, somebody that would tell me, well, you know, even though you apply for VA benefits, it may take two years. Somebody could prepare me, somebody who could understand what I'm going through. Everybody throws the term uh, PTSD around, but they don't really understand what it means. They don't take the time to fully, fully understand what it means. So that, that would be awesome, that a place where you can go, not just throw you out, that place you go, decompress, learn what you need to do. Um, and also, if we could get trained. For example, if I came out of the military doing pharmacy tech, maybe train me to be a pharmacy tech in the civilian world or find out what direction I wanted to do, definitely somewhere with careers, that would be, totally awesome that we can just, because we want to be stable. We, we're used to being stable. We used to getting that check twice a month. And when we come out, we want to be able to feel like we're, we're normal, we're functional. And definitely if we could train our families to understand what we're going through, that would maybe stop a lot of homelessness because they, they just get fed up. They just, they just they, they may think we're lazy. Some people may come out, they may have addiction problems, but if, Everyone can be trained together on how to understand. I'm sure that will help a lot. Thank you so much, Craig. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. I'd like to open up um, questions from the audience. Anybody? I have some questions if you don't. Um, I wanted to ask, I guess, um, maybe this is best for Richard or possibly Martha, but um, what was the role that data played in um, your success in ending veterans' homelessness? Um, data is really critical. Um, we are maintaining a database every day of all the, um, all the homeless veterans who've ever been homeless and, and, and what's their status as well as uh, mm -hmm. any that are coming uh, newly into homelessness and what's happening with them. Um, have we assessed them? Have they been assigned to a navigator? Have they, um, you know, have we identified what housing is appropriate for them? And where are they in the process of getting into that housing? And it's all being reported out every week. What is, what, what does our aggregate data look like? Are we on target for maintaining the functional zero when we were in our getting to uh, zero campaign? Um, you know, we had, uh, in a, we had a, a weekly thermometer telling us how many uh, veterans we had housed in the campaign, um, and we were also keeping track of all those that we had left and how many of them there were and where they were in the process. And so um, that really allowed us to keep the pressure on and also um, individually to identify where all the problems were. Um, the, so the only, I mean, I, I think that is critical to what we've seen to, um, to be uh, important to success in, in nearly every community that we've seen have the dramatic progress that we, um, we've seen. And at the federal level, you know, the, the data is just 
been proven to be really critical, and it's amazing how much data there is available on veteran homelessness now. But back when um, uh, uh, former VA Secretary Eric Shinseki uh, made the commitment to end veteran homelessness um, by 2015, you know, he, uh, the first thing he said was, I can't solve a problem that I can't see, and that the most important thing was, let's figure out how we get this, our arms around the size of the problem and figure out what we need to do and how many resources we need. And so now we're at a point now where we can actually say, you know, how much hud bash, how much SVSVF do we need to deploy and when and in which communities, and we're using data in real time to figure that out. And it was data that enabled us to figure out, you know, uh, we need uh, not 400 million, but we need actually another 7 million at least to deploy, and that's where uh, VA, some of you know, um, at, with SSVF have, have actually reissued a, the, the NOFA so that uh, they can actually deploy another $7 million. That was driven uh, by data in our sense that we need actually a little bit more. Uh, you know, it was our data that said we need to HUD de deploy and make most of the HUD bash awards by April of this year, and we need, uh, you know, X number of referrals. I think it's, we need, uh, nationally, we need about 2,700 referrals a month to HUD bash in order for us to hit our utilization target. I mean, that's the, the kind of precision that we're trying to get to uh, with the use of data, because, you know, uh, those data points, it's not just numbers, those are people, right? These are people that we actually absolutely have an obligation to serve. And I just actually want to just say, Craig, that you know, on behalf of the entire federal government, I, I think it's a tragedy that you came out of service after having served and not getting the support you need. And um, it is, uh, you know, something that I um, absolutely will bring back because that's a, the kind of failure that should not have happened. So. Your ideas were great. Yeah. Um, if I could also add one other data point that I think is really essential, um, and this we collected also every week. Um, we collected data from the VA as to how many VASH vouchers, both turnover and new, were actually going to people on our master list. And in the beginning, that number was not a very high number. And it's because there is a varied understanding of what homelessness means. Um, and that is really critical, I think, to accomplishing this goal. Mm -hmm. okay. um, uh, Michael? Question from this table. Um, Well, you know, we, um, you know, we tried to use the system that the um, uh, 25 uh, cities campaign had come up with, but ultimately we found that didn't really work too well. So it was as low tech as a Google Doc in the end. Um, and we're still trying to kind of upgrade that. You do what you need to do, you know. Um, what's important is that you have one central database. Um, in terms of, um, you need to kind of exert leadership. The continuum of care just basically took leadership of this, and we just got everybody to agree that this is what we're going to do. Um, you, you, and, and that's why it really helps to have the strong leadership of the mayor behind you, because you're going to need to exert leadership, and you're going to need to say, if we're going to meet this deadline, we got to do this. Okay. Bonnie? Hi. Um, I'm from the VA. Um, I run the Healthcare for Homeless Veterans program. And I really want to thank everybody and for your story. It's amazing. And it sounded like you were able to get a lot of help that you did because you went to the Bronx VA to the Healthcare for Homeless Veterans program up there on the fifth floor. And I just wanted to let everybody hear that in the veterans moment, we do have that um, service at every VA location. Caitlin here is one of our homeless triage workers at the Manhattan VA. So if you are working with any veterans, you can just send them in and work very close to Kenelsey and Allison and just trying to coordinate the whole effort and get all of our mass vouchers to you. So please do come in and we can check for eligibility within 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody else the woman in the back? Hi, yeah. I just had a question. I was really, um, I was interested in everything. I think it really would be a good um, a good thing, and maybe USICH could do this like a primer 
on all the resources because I think one of the problems early on is that a lot of the people in the COC don't totally understand all the rules in the VA programs. And you really need to become an expert on all of that. You need to understand exactly what are the eligibility and how that eligibility is being interpreted. Um, and you need to understand what the rules are, like how long you can use um, SFVF, how many months, what, what, what are the prerequisites for moving someone to, you can't just move someone from SFVF to VASH. You have to actually uh, have them apply for VASH first. <laughs> um, and so there's, there's, there's complicated rules. It's important to really get on top of them, and that might be something that we could, you know, use some help nationally to do. I mean, I can kind of tell you what I know, and I know Allison can, and others can, Nicole can, but um, uh, it, it is a complicated, crazy quilt of regulations. These programs don't really work that well together, um, and a lot of them aren't really designed, I think, uh, with best practices in mind, and somehow we have to make them work. Yeah, I think SFVF, though, is really the key um, to uh, maintaining the functional zero. We've got to make SFVF really work. It's a tremendous idea, a tremendous resource. We need more of it, um, and we need it to be more flexible. But we need it to be more focused on the homeless. Mar so, Mar uh, Martha, you gave another to-do list. You always give us to-do lists. So I got nothing. <laughs> one more thing on my to-do list. But also the other thing is that one of the things that Martha did and we, we certainly got a lot of that from, from July through December of last year, was Martha had a bat phone right to, to USICH and to VA and to HUD and the White House. And you know, anything Martha needed in terms of, can you clarify this rule for me? Can I do this? Can I do that? And my boss at the time, Laura Zeilinger, would be like, figure out what Martha needs, and we help Martha with whatever she needs. So we extend that same invitation to all of you in New York City. We give you a bat phone, give us a call, give us an email, and we will help you figure this out because it's too important for us to not um, figure this out. And you're right, these, these programs weren't designed to fit together. We know that what we need to do is make them work together and fit together as a system. Um, they weren't designed that way, and, and you know, the way um, certainly these programs work in Congress is, is you know, one program gets created one year, one program gets created another year. They're not thinking about how they're actually going to fit together. And so our job at the federal government, certainly your job at the local level, is figuring out how do we put those puzzle pieces together. And they can be put together. It just takes a little work. All right, I think we're just about at 12.15 now, so I want to thank um, the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yep. So the, the story is that, that we get having been in the VA a long time is that the vets, or they're not vets yet, the <laughs> soldiers, they're so anxious to leave. They offer them the services, and they just are, I want to go home. They drop their packs, they're gone. That's what we hear. Maybe it's not true. Maybe they're not. We don't know. So, so we, are, we are absolutely... We working on that, and it's and it's new. But the the Department of Defense has has created a transition assistance program, and t they essentially provide a boot camp to every transitioning service member. This just started end of last year, so it is fairly new, and again, uh, uh, tragic that we we didn't have this in place beforehand. But where every every transitioning service member goes through uh, a week, I think, long process where they get. Uh, again, it's not ideal, but it's a, a kind of boot camp of here's everything you need to know about your transition to the community. And they will do an assessment of your employment needs and your housing needs and your transportation needs and develop an individualized transition plan. And in that transition plan, they are supposed to identify whether or not a veteran has a viable housing situation post-transition. And we're working to make sure that that's actually happening and that also when uh, an, a, a service member identifies that they do not have a viable housing placement, that uh, there will be a warm handoff to VA and VA will do an active reach out to that veteran, uh, that service member who's becoming a veteran, 
uh, to make sure that, that they are connected to homeless prevention services and housing assistance. That is what we've laid out as a commitment. That is what I, we're going to be tracking. Uh, we have uh, the White House who said to Department of Defense and, and VA, we want to see data. Again, we can't, can't solve the problem we can't see. We want to see data on numbers. How many transitioning service members are saying that they don't have housing? How many folks have VA reached out to? Because that is exactly what we need to do. When you have people still coming back to New Orleans and to Houston who are veterans who are newly becoming homeless, that is unacceptable. And so we are, we are working to fix that. And I want to hear any stories that you have about veterans who are not getting that or who've been recently transitioned. And, and um, again, the more information we can get, the bigger, the better we can solve that problem. So I appreciate you bringing that up, Emily. Okay, thank you. NYCCAPS.org. Um, so check that out as well. Um, so I really want to thank Richard and Martha and Craig for coming. I want to thank all of you. Um, so everybody. Really well. Hi, Godfrey. How you doing?